Welcome to Theology in Perspective, the Bible teaching ministry of Dr. Daniel Woodhead. Welcome back to Theology in Perspective. I'm Daniel Woodhead and I'm blessed that you could join us again today. We're in the book of Revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ, and it's his unveiling as he is today, not as he was when he left this earth, but as he is today. And what we are seeing here is that this risen Jesus has come to the Apostle John, who's banished to the Isle of Patmos in the Aegean Sea by the Roman Emperor Domitian for teaching the Word of God, and he receives this incredible message about future events of this world. Now, I have to say that only the biblically illiterate fail to see that we are in the last days. And in one of our previous sessions, we saw that that began with the First World War. And uh, we see the uh, Jewish idiomatic phrase, nation rising against nation and kingdom against kingdom, where the Lord Jesus himself used these terms to discuss the last days. Now, his second coming is going to pertain to the entire world. So in Matthew's record of Jesus' words, we're talking about the beginning of the latter days is the First World War. We also saw from the Old Testament that the prophetic word was to be shut up and sealed. Now, the prophet Daniel received this word, but thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. But it's open now. It's open now and it's understood now. And this is a book that's meant to be understood. Which is why I'm here telling you what this book says. We saw the general outline in verse 1, uh, excuse me, verse 19 of chapter 1. We saw that John saw the risen Christ and who he really is now. I want to give you a very brief outline of the Revelation sequences. Jesus is revealed. Then there are messages to the churches. These are warnings and an exposition of all church history. Then there is the rapture of the invisible church. And these are terms that I'm going to explain as we go through this book the visible church, and the invisible church. Then there is a seven-year tribulation that will begin. Christ returns at the end of this with his saints to complete the battle of Armageddon, and he sets up and he rules the earth for a thousand years. And then the eternal order is established. It's called the New Jerusalem, and it comes down from heaven. And that's this book in a very broad outline. I want to talk for a few moments about this concept of the kingdom. And it's, a, it's just a long-awaited time that's at the end of the Great Tribulation where Christ, the King, returns and he sets up his millennial kingdom, or his messianic kingdom, as others would say. John, the other apostles in the early church fathers, looked forward to it. So do we. They knew exactly what this was. And some theological constructs just refused to accept the millennial kingdom, even though the Lord clearly says this is going to be for a thousand years. And it's in Revelation 20 where that term a thousand years is used six times. Very clear. I mentioned in a previous lesson the quote by two of Jesus' brothers, Jude, grandsons, regarding the testimony they gave to Domitian when they were arrested. And this was recorded by the father of church history, Eusebius of Caesarea. 
and they were taken by Domitian, and he thought that there was some insurrection going on in a kingdom that was going to be established, and he said, no, 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 when the Lord returns, he's going to set up his kingdom. Oh, well, Domitian then looks at this as inconsequential. Who cares? <laughs> we care. We care. Now, John was placed in this spiritized state. He was fully conscious, fully aware and that what Jesus had done with his consciousness, and he was transported in time to see future events. And those are events that are yet future to us. That is the tribulation, or the Lord's Day, which is actually called the Day of the Lord. Today, I want to focus on a concept called the times of the Gentiles, or the time of the Gentiles, if you will. It, it's a sort of a parenthetical exposition here of Scripture. Uh, we're going to be discussing this between chapters 1 and 2. Chapter 1 we saw is the revealing of Jesus to John through the angels. And he's told to write the things that he saw, the things that are, and the things that will be. So chapters 2 and 3 are going to be a discussion of the whole church history in abridged form through the visible church. Now the visible church is simply all the buildings and people in them with various names on the door like Roman and Orthodox and Baptist and Presbyterian and Reformed and so on. That's not the real church. Jesus didn't create any of those types of churches. Jesus said his church is invisible. His sheep know him. His sheep follow him. They hear his voice. The invisible church is the genuine church, and that's made up of all true, genuine believers in Christ from all ages since the church began. And the church had a beginning. That church had a beginning. Just reading the Bible naturally as those words are to be used, you see that the church began on the fourth Jewish holiday of the year in which Jesus died. The first one, Passover, Jesus died. The second one, Unleavened Bread, he went into the ground. Third one is First Fruits, he rose from the dead. And the next holiday is Pentecost. That's when he left and, well, he just left, and then the church was started by the Holy Spirit. So the visible church is made up of all people, whether they believe or not, they're just in all these places called churches. But the real church is the genuine believers whose hearts have been transformed. That's our church. That's the church. Luke 21, 24 says, And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now this is Luke's account of the Lord's Olivet Discourse. He discusses the circumstances surrounding the Lord's return to the earth, and he states what Jesus said here, he's just repeating it. Jerusalem will be trodden down until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Well, what's he talking about here? Why is this important to us as believers in Jesus? You know, we seek to draw closer to this Jesus, and we should know what he has for us and beware of the earthly circumstances he's telling us about. In Matthew 24, 25, the Lord Jesus made a very poignant statement. He said, Behold, I have told you before. In this section of the Olivet Discourse, he's warning us to be aware of the deception that's in the earth today. And the Great Tribulation is coming. He warns his children just as we want to warn our children of the evil that's in the world and how to avoid it as much as possible. This is an important part of how we should live for him. We're to obey him 
in all things, including observing the warnings that he gave us. Jesus wants only what's best for us. You know, even if we fully don't understand all of his commands, we trust him. Think of Proverbs 3, verses 5 to 6. It's constant trusting of the Lord. The times of the Gentiles are just a long period of time from the Babylonian captivity of the Jews until the second coming of Jesus. During this time, the Gentiles are going to have control over the city of Jerusalem. There's been some times when there's been temporary Jewish control over the city. One was the Maccabean period when Judas Maccabeus and his family threw off the yoke of the Greeks in one Antiochus Epiphanes, about 164 BC. <clears throat> the first Jewish revolt against Rome was in AD 66 to AD 70. And uh, the Jews got control over what had been called Palestine or became, it was going to be called Palestine. And, uh, and then the Jews had control again over Jerusalem during the Bar Kokhba rebellion against Rome, and that was A.D. 132 to 135. That was when Israel became known as Palestine because the Emperor Hadrian was so angry with the Jews after that rebellion that he wanted to rename the land after their mortal enemies, the Philistines, and he mispronounced the name. The Palestines, he called them. So the Palestine is not a good word. You know, in the 1967 Six-Day War, which is temporary, that happened uh, again because Jerusalem will be trodden down by the Gentiles for another three and a half years. In other words, that's just another time that the Gentiles have taken, or excuse me, that the Jews have taken control. They will have control again, just like I said. But any Jewish takeover of the city before the second coming is only temporary. It doesn't mean that the times of the Gentiles have ended. The times of the Gentiles can only end when Gentiles are no longer able to trod down Jerusalem. But in order to understand the concept, we, we have to study uh, four Old Testament passages from the book of Daniel, and then we're going to put them together, and each passage elaborates on the previous passage. Now, God revealed these passages to Daniel through visions. Look at Daniel 2, verse 31. But, O king, thou sawest and behold a great image. This image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. Daniel, verse 32. This image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass. 33. His legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. 34. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and break them into pieces. Verse 35. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken, to pieces together, and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them, and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Now, Daniel provides this general description <clears throat> of the awesomeness of the image that Nebuchadnezzar had seen. Daniel was in Babylon. He'd been captured by Nebuchadnezzar in 605 B.C., and he was taken to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar has an image of some great big thing, and uh, Daniel is brought to him to describe it. Now, the image is described as having a head of gold, breast and arms of silver, belly and thighs of brass, legs of iron, and ending with the feet and toes of part iron and part clay. 
Now these metals have some pretty important characteristics here. They increase in strength as they go from gold to iron and they decrease in value. Keep that in mind. They increase in strength and they decrease in value. The fulfillment will be the decrease of the character of authority and rule. Babylon was an absolute monarchy with the monarch above the law. The king could do anything he wanted, even if it broke the laws of the land. The Medo-Persian monarch, which succeeded Babylon, was not above the law and didn't have authority even to change his own decrees. The Hellenic kings, <clears throat> which means they came from Greece, they followed Media Persia. They didn't have any dynastic or royal right to rule, and they ruled by force of conquest and personal gifts. Finally, Roman imperialism is the last empire that was a republic that basically degenerated into mob rule merging with the imperial form of government. So those are the four empires, but there will be an increase of the strength of these empires, one over the other. A stone then destroys the image, and the stone smites the image on its feet. Then, with the image destroyed, the stone becomes a great mountain that fills the whole earth. The stone cut without hands emphasizes his divine origin, the Lord Jesus. We know who the rock is. Christ is always described as a rock throughout Scripture. Consider Luke 6.48 or Romans 9.33 or even 1 Corinthians 10.4. Now, after Daniel describes the nature of this image of Nebuchadnezzar, he then goes on to give him an interpretation of it. And I'm going to read that interpretation starting in Daniel chapter 2, verse 36. This is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. O king, thou art a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of heaven, hath he given unto thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. And after thee shall arise another kingdom, inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces, and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and the toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. But there shall be in it of the strength of iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay." And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. But in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. Now, after declaring this interpretation, Daniel begins to interpret the meaning of the head of gold as being Nebuchadnezzar, who destroyed the first temple in Jerusalem in 586 B.C. 
So Babylon was the first empire that began the times of the Gentiles when they dominated Jerusalem. The actual grant given to Nebuchadnezzar included the whole earth, but he chose not to take advantage of this. And Jeremiah affirms that fact in his book in chapter 27, verses 5 to 8. Ezekiel does too in his chapter 26, verses 7 to 14. Now, the two arms of silver united unto the breast of silver represents the two nations of Medes and Persians who established the Medio Persian Empire and declared it to be inferior to the Babylonians. It just lacked the inner unity of Babylon because the Medes and Persians were united, but they were never really fused into one people group. And further, their government was not above the mistakes of the law. The Greeks, who succeeded them, also known as the Hellenistic Empire, followed the Medio Persian Empire, and it symbolizes by the belly and the two thighs of brass. Because the third territory embraced both east and west. The two thighs may also represent Syria and Egypt, which arose out of the Hellenistic Empire and controlled Jewish territory and Jerusalem. Now, its grant was the same as Babylon, but like Babylon, they did not choose to exercise it and take that grant. Now, the rest of the image represents the fourth Gentile Empire, and that one goes through a bunch of different stages. <clears throat> Three of them are presented in this text. First, there's the United Stage. The United Stage gives way to the two-division stage, and, and that still has the strength of iron. But eventually, the fourth Gentile Empire gives way to a ten-division stage. And that can be seen in the ten toes here, being composed of part iron and part clay. Now, part of this ten-division stage is going to be strong. Heart's going to be brittle and weak. The lack of cohesiveness is uh, especially evident in this image within the toes. Unity is impossible. And the ten divisions take place because the different elements just won't coalesce together. The fourth Gentile Empire is unique from all the previous ones. It totally subdues and crushes all that preceded. It's the fourth Gentile empire that is particularly emphasized by the text dealing with the times of the Gentile. However, the fifth empire that will follow it will not be Gentile, but Jewish. Two prominent symbols are used here, but they're consistent with their use everywhere else in the Bible. You know, whenever the word stone is used symbolically, it's always a symbol of the Lord Jesus, God the Son, the second person of the, Trinity, of the Trinity, the Messiah of Israel. And wherever the word mountain is used symbolically, it's always a symbol of a king, a kingdom, or a throne. Therefore, following the fourth world Gentile empire, God's going to set up his own kingdom. The kingdom is set up during the ten division stage, and this brings an end to the domination of the other kingdoms. And in the end, the image of Gentile domination is going to be smashed at the second coming once the messianic stone smashes Gentile domination. The kingdom of God is going to be set up. So, let me summarize here. <laughs> the, the first passage dealing with the times of the Gentiles is a period of time when four Gentile empires are going to follow one another in sequence. And the fourth empire is going to go through several different stages. But eventually, this is going to give way to God setting up his own kingdom. And the Gentile empires are of human origin, but the kingdom of the stone is of divine origin. And while the Gentile empires are all temporary, God's kingdom is eternal. So, this then is the sequence. He started with the Babylonian Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire, the Hellenistic Empire, the fourth empire that will be described later, 
the united stage of that empire, the ten division stage, and then finally the messianic kingdom. Now, I am going to uh, close for there today, but we're going to continue this discussion of the times of the Gentiles in our next session because we are going to go to the seventh chapter of Daniel where Daniel has a dream, if you will. It's a vision, which is much stronger than a dream, and he receives information about beasts. And these beasts describe in great detail characteristics of these empires. And there's a lot of characteristics of the last beast, if you will. So we're going to look at that uh, when we resume this. It's real important that we understand that the outline of all of human history uh, since the Babylonian captivity in 586 B.C. of Jerusalem are important for us to understand this book of Revelation. Remember what I said early on. It's important to understand the Old Testament in order to understand not just the New Testament, but Revelation. That's the key, understanding the Old Testament. This is a Jewish book. It was written by Jewish people. All the apostles were Jewish. All the writers of the Bible have been Jewish. Jesus came unto his people, the Jews. Yes, they rejected him. At least the leaders did. The common people didn't by and large. But the leaders did. Beloved, if you do not know this Jesus of Nazareth, I would beg you to consider his claims. He claimed to be God. He claimed to come into this world for the express purpose of sacrificing himself to appease God's justice. Not vengeance, but justice. Satan, the celestial being, had polluted the heavenly tabernacle and came into the world domain in the Garden of Eden and caused sin to come into the world through our first parents, Adam and Eve. That sin has caused a corruption here that we can't imagine the magnitude of. It's way beyond our understanding because this is all we know. Jesus provides the way out of this craziness by trusting in Jesus, putting your faith in Jesus. The Bible tells us that we are saved by grace through our faith. And it's not something we can do. Otherwise, we'd brag about it. This is nothing we can do other than just believe the historic fact that Jesus died and rose from the dead. And I would ask if you have made that decision today that you call us or write us at the address or the email that is on the screen in front of you now and we will send you a free brochure, no cost, we won't follow up, we won't call, we won't bother you. We want you to have a relationship with the Lord of the universe to guarantee that when you leave this body, as we all will leave our bodies, you will be with Jesus in paradise on the other side. If you've made that decision today, call, write, tell us that you've done this. God bless you. We hope you have been blessed by this message today on a contemporarily relevant Bible topic. Dr. Woodhead has been teaching the Bible for 25 years. He is a pastor, an author, and conference speaker on various biblical subjects. Dr. Woodhead is the Dean of the Jewish Studies School at Schofield Seminary. His seminary teaching includes the Old Testament and Biblical Hebrew. He has attended Hebrew University in Jerusalem and Hebrew College in Massachusetts. Let us know if you have any questions about today's broadcast. We look forward to providing you with continuing Bible messages each week on this station. God bless you.